And some good news now. Buffalo Bills player DeMar Hamlin has been discharged from hospital today. His collapse and cardiac arrest on the football field last week has put safety in the NFL under the microscope. And our next guest certainly knows a thing or two about football injuries. Nate Jackson played for the Denver Broncos for five years before injury ended his career back in 2009. He spent his retirement raising awareness of the dangers of the game. His memoir, Slow Getting Up, is an eye-opening account of what it's like to be a professional athlete who both inflicts and endures pain. Here's what he told Michelle Martin. Thanks, Christian. Nate Jackson, thank you so much for joining us. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So obviously people who follow football will probably know you. Um, you wrote a, a wonderful, a very attention-getting and frankly fairly graphic memoir about your time in the NFL called Slow Getting Up. But for people who don't follow football so closely, could you just tell us a little bit about what your job was? I mean, you retired, you spent most of your career with the Denver Broncos, you were a tight end. Yeah. What does that job entail? So I was a tight end for four years and a wide receiver for two. So a total of six years with the Denver Broncos. I came into the league as a wide receiver, just wanting to catch passes and get the glory and score touchdowns. And, you know, I did that in college and then I got to the NFL and you realize that there's a bunch of other dudes who have the same plan. And so you have to kind of uh, fall in and do what's asked of you. And after a couple of years as a receiver, I was asked to put on some weight and play tight end, which is a much more physical position. You're down next to the offensive lineman your hands in the dirt you're blocking those really large human beings who are really good at their jobs but also I got to catch passes as well but I was this core special teams member as well so that meant I was on kickoff kickoff return punt punt return but that switch from wide receiver to tight end made me a lot more intimate with the physicality of the game um, because you're down there with those big bodies and you're hitting almost every single play so had my share of injuries and I when I stopped playing I wanted to write about the reality of the NFL. I love football. I always have, and I still do. But there's the other side of the coin that a lot of people don't get to hear about, don't get to read about. That's what I wanted to bring to people, and that's why I wrote the book. And something you wrote about in a recent piece for The Atlantic is that just here's the reality of it. There's a lot of inflicting pain, and there's a lot of taking pain. Right. Because as a receiver, you're a target, right? Yeah, you're, you're the, yep, the defense is coming after you. They want to hit you. They want to hurt you. They want to dislodge the ball from you. Um, but it is. It's about equal inflicting pain and absorbing it. And from a very early age, I didn't start playing football until I was in high school. My parents wouldn't let me. I wanted to at an early age, but they knew it was dangerous. And so they told me that I can't play till I'm in high school. They were hoping that I would lose interest in it. Um, I didn't. As soon as I got to high school, I signed up and got out there and put on a helmet and put on shoulder pads. I had been playing at the park with my friends. I had been playing uh, in the street with my friends, watching every single game that came on. But there's nothing like the visceral reality of putting on a helmet, putting on shoulder pads, and running full speed into another human being. That's really what it is. And on day one of football practice, I realized that the sport was a lot different than what I had thought, consuming it on television and playing in the street with my friends. Uh, hard plastic and metal sinking into your supple flesh and bone day after day after day. The pain is a constant, and it becomes a badge of honor. It's about who can endure the most pain. The more pain you can take, the tougher and the more you're celebrated. And so that becomes ingrained in football players at an early age. And then the inflicting part of it, you know, when you're desensitized to your own pain, you're not thinking about your own. I'm certainly not thinking about the pain of my opponent. So when I hit somebody really, really hard, I'm not worried about how much that hurts him. I'm, I'm, I feel good that I'm doing that part of it as well. One of the reasons that obviously we're talking to you right now is that just horrifying scene that, that the football watching part of the country took in yeah. on Monday night football where players of the bills literally went into cardiac arrest on the field, had to have life saving intervention on the field. And, you know, we're, we're experiencing this as like a terrible shock. But one of the things that you point out in your book and that you've written about subsequently is that we really shouldn't be shocked. Is that right? 
Well, when you're strictly talking about the action on the field and the collisions and the violence and the speed and the velocity, no, we shouldn't be shocked. And the fact that we see the guys just pop up from these huge hits, we call them routine football hits, it desensitizes us, the audience, to what those guys are really going through, the physicality of what they're doing. But when you're down there on field level, watching these guys, how quickly they move, how big the collisions are, um, the equipment that some people think, you know, Europeans, when they talk about football, they say, oh, you guys are are wimpy because you have to wear this armor over you. Well, that armor becomes your most dangerous weapon on a football field. I have a hard helmet on my head. I know the best way to bring down a larger man is to use that armor and hit him with it. So that becomes a weapon. And so it is surprising to me that more stuff like this doesn't happen. I have been on the field in 2007, for example, we played a game in Buffalo, Kevin Everett, was a player for the Buffalo Bills who was covering a kickoff, had a routine mm -hmm. tackle, put his head down, and he broke his neck. He was motionless on the football field for 15 or 20 minutes. You could hear a pin drop in the stadium. They brought the ambulance out, stabilized his neck, got him in the ambulance, and they drove off. And no sooner was the ambulance out of sight in the tunnel than that murmur started again in the crowd, that anticipatory football crowd murmur. They were ready for the action again. And sure enough, the whistle blows and you're right back at it. So I think that's what was unusual about the game we saw last week was they actually stopped play because of mm -hmm. the reaction of the teammates. You saw those guys circling their, their teammate who was – uh, you know, they were administering CPR on this guy and they couldn't control their emotions. They were sobbing on a football field, which to me was the biggest surprise because when I go out there on a football field, I believe I'm Superman. There's nothing that can penetrate mm -hmm. my game day armor and not even the injury of a teammate and the things I've seen, you still snap back into it and play football. That was a terrifying scene because of the way his teammates reacted. And the two coaches uh, mm -hmm. rightly said, hey, we're not going to go out there and play the game. The game is over. So maybe that means we're evolving. You know, maybe that means we are learning. And this happens, frankly, routinely. People either lose consciousness or get clearly hurt. They take, you know, hard hits. Even routine hits can be very hard hits. You sometimes hear it. I mean, some of the players are mic'd on the field and you hear that kind of crunching. And so, so what do you think has changed? Like, why do you think it is that in this particular moment, this particular event was so shocking both to the players and to the audience such that they did have to suspend the game. Why do you think that is? I believe it was because of the CPR that was being administered. Typically a guy, you know, <laughs> breaks his neck, but he's not, they're not pump, doing pumps on his chest to try to save his life. It was clear to these guys around him, his teammates and his coaches, they believe they were watching their friend die on the football field because his heart literally stopped. And I think that it was such a frightening situation for those guys, those coaches, those teams, that they decided they couldn't go back out onto the field that day. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they both uh, both teams just played this last week and both teams are playing in the playoffs. Um, I'm not suggesting that you cancel the game of football. I think the virtues of football outweigh the, the, the problems. But, no, I think that that injury was unique and in that we all watched. It was on national television. All the eyeballs were there. The camera work is so detailed and effective guys get hit all the time in the head and the camera doesn't catch them they see stars or go out for a second and the camera never sees them and you never hear anyone talk about it you know you hear old timers who played for 10 12 15 years saying every single game they would lose consciousness for a minute or two or a second or two and then snap back into it so that's part of the ethos of the game the NFL is trying to stop that. They've made a lot of rules to try to protect players from, you know, egregious hits and protect a quarterback or a defenseless receiver from getting teed off on. But there's just some stuff that happens in the scrum that you don't ever see and that you can't protect. To me, it's about the medical attention they receive after the hit, after the injury, not pushing someone back on the field the next week. That's when it becomes really, really problematic. And to, to me, you know, there are very few professions in the world where you're out there working and you have a circle of doctors watching you perform, waiting for you to drop so they can give you immediate medical attention. DeMar Hamlin's immediate medical attention saved his life. Same with Kevin Everett in Buffalo. Um, and so that's very rare to get that kind of immediate medical attention. And I feel like that kind of obscures the reality of what some of these injuries actually are because there's a window of time after the injury that's crucial. These guys always get treatment in that window. And to me, it obscures how violent this game really is. But why do why do you think we as a country love the sport so much? 
Why does it have such a grip on us? What do you think? I think it's I think it's a lot of factors. I think that the the very reason that it's so dangerous and so violent is also one of the reasons that it's so popular. I think people are are drawn to that sort of competition. The collisions, we talked earlier about that crunching sound. The NFL knows that's a marketable sound. They have a sound guy on the sideline with a big old uh, satellite mic pointed at those collisions to get those pieces of sound involved in the broadcast because that's what people come for those big hits but there's also the acts of um uh poetic movement the the ballet the, the the ballet out there um the peace that you find in the chaos out there and there is a value in enduring pain in getting through something you don't think you'll be able to get through it's violent but I push myself through it and there's triumph and glory on the other side of it. There are very other sports that dance on that razor's edge like football does. I found a lot of value in enduring that pain and yeah. pushing myself to that distance. And, you know, I endured and saw a lot of pain on a football field. No pain was as great as the pain I felt when it was over for good for me. <laughs> and I saw the game moving on without me. It was in my blood. There was no amount of pain or injury. I wouldn't endure to try to chase this football glory because the glory exists on the other side of that pain. And if you can push yourself through it, Something beautiful can happen on the other side. I think football fans appreciate that. The NFL is still incredibly pop incredibly popular, incredibly profitable, okay? But there are signs that parents, at least, of younger kids are taking the tactic that your, your folks did, which is they're not letting their littlest play. I mean, the fact is that participation in the youngest leagues, the leagues that serve the youngest players, is falling off. Is the, the fact that there is some increased skepticism about the sport is that is that penetrating decision making at the highest levels it certainly is affecting decision making the nfl is very aware of the youth participation in the sport they want to facilitate as many kids playing football as possible they started this heads up tackling initiative a few years back to deal with this specific problem concussions for a while were um more on the forefront of people's minds when considering the sport it actually has kind of dissipated you don't hear as much talk about cte anymore as when that was first discovered because of the concussion protocol but i think some parents are still reticent of it and rightly so not every kid should be playing football when people ask if i'm going to let my son play football and he's three years old i say i don't know i don't know what kind of athlete he'll be i don't know if he'll be cut out for it and i think sometimes the popularity of football and the popularity of the nfl makes it seem like every little kid should be playing football every little kid should not be playing football i remember being in freshman year uh, in high school and there were some kids out there that should not have been out there they not only were their bodies not developed and they're practicing against kids whose bodies are developed but um they just don't have the physical tools to withstand those types of hits but i think ultimately the kids who are cut out for it, the kids who do have that aggressive type of athleticism, that mentality, their bodies are built for it. I don't see a problem with letting them play football and in high school, allowing them to go out and play the game they love and follow their dreams as long as the medical attention they receive after an injury is sufficient. That's the most important thing to me. If a kid gets a concussion and it's clear, don't let him back on the field. Take his helmet away. Don't get swept up in the in the the tornado of emotions on the football field that make you think like the only thing that matters here is winning this football game. It's the livelihood that all these guys are involved in and invested in. And so when a player tells you, I'm fine, I can go, and you look in his eyes and you believe him because you want to win this game, you send him back out there against his best interest. And that's when the real problems come. Not the first concussion, but the one you get five days later, the one you get two weeks after that. That's what we need to protect these guys from. So I guess the question is, where does that ethical responsibility lie? Is it the audience? Is it those of us who watch, who just are so enamored of seeing what the human body can do? It's, where, where is it? Where do you think it is? It's a great question because the football players who play, they do love the game. They are on their own journey. No one's forcing them to do that. They fell in love with the game at an early age, and they're achieving their mm -hmm. dreams. But the attention that they get when they play the game well has nothing to do with them. It has to do with our uh, affection with the game. It has to do with the fans. It has to do with the money involved. It has to do with the betting involved. It has to do with the television contracts. I think 50, the top 50 most viewed television shows last year were all NFL football games. Like mm -hmm. an NFL preseason football game gets a higher viewership than a World Series game.
okay? People are obsessed with watching this game of being brought into the drama, to the violence, to the collisions. No players were forced to do it. And, and a lot of people say, you know what you signed up for, and so you can't complain about it. Yes and no. You know it's violent, but you don't know the extent of what you're risking as far as the brain damage. And, and we do know a little more about that now. But players in meetings, for example, at the facility, aren't, be, aren't they're not talking about their bodies and their health. They're talking about how to go win this football game. So the best interest of the player's health is not always kept in mind. That's why the union is really important. And the doctors and neurological specialists who are working with these players are very, very important. But the ethical quandary, I think the just the popularity of it shows that there's a lot of people who don't care, you know, what the players are risking. They want their football no matter what. The story I talk, told about Kevin Everett nearly dying on the field as soon as they got him out of the stadium, the game continued. Um, people wanted to see a football game. And so as long as that interest is there, there's going to be guys willing to go out and sacrifice their health to play the game. You still watch? I do. do still, yeah, I mean, I talk about it. I, I, I host a radio show and I talk about sports for a living. I still love the game. I love the competition. I love what goes into having to be good at it. Football is one of those sports where mm -hmm. you can't cut corners. You can't fake it. You can't phone it in or microwave it. You have to work hard and do things the right way. And the results show up on the field. If you let up just a little inch for one millimeter of a second, you lose. The play doesn't work. You lose the game. It requires everyone going all out the entire time. The cooperation it requires from that many people, 53 guys on a team, plus like 15 to 20 coaches, all those guys working together to accomplish one goal. I think that's what I value so much about it. The life lessons, persevering, not dwelling on your mistakes, believing in yourself, trusting the guys around you, being part of a team, that stuff is virtuous and has a role in the outside world. And so I think football teaches great lessons to people, but the medical attention has to be delivered adequately and immediately and not force these guys back on the field if they have an injury. Hey, Jackson, thanks so much for talking to us. Thanks, Michelle. Appreciate it.